Hello, good people of the internet. My name is Andy and you're watching Geek Curio. And with me today is Brandon. Um, how are you doing, Brandon? I'm good. Thanks for having me. Thanks for setting this up. Thank, thank you very much for agreeing to come on the show. And you're calling all the way from Japan today, aren't you? Yes, I'm a small suburb outside of Tokyo. Excellent, excellent. And how are you finding life over there? Uh, yeah, so I recently moved here. Mm -hmm. um, it's It's been quite a big change. Uh, I came from America, mm -hmm. Michigan, uh, in America, and it's a, it's a big city. Like, Tokyo's huge. I'm outside of the major <laughs> part of Tokyo, but I'm still in Tokyo. It's city for forever. Yeah. Uh, there's a lot of little just rules that I have to learn. The language barrier is rough. I speak a bit of Japanese, but, like, at times it's just... It's just like, oh, wait, what, what's happening? What's being said? <laughs> uh, it's extra work just to, to be literate, right? So... Well, it's, I, it's, well, it's yeah, one of the things like, when you immerse yourself so much into a culture, you will... I, I I'm sure you will pick it up very, very quickly and um, you'll be an expert in no time. So uh, I know what you mean about cities, though, I, although a lot of people don't notice it, but I'm actually from London originally. And yeah, when I, it was a complete opposite for me because I moved out away from London and I had to get used to the whole um, town mentality with a lot less people and everybody knows each other as well. Whereas in London, you don't even know who lives two doors down from you. So but um I walk past thousands <laughs> of people a day I don't know anyone but um we're here today to talk about you and uh what you've been bringing to tabletop rpgs and the c22 system but first of all what i'd love to know is how you got into rpgs tabletop rpgs in the first place what what motivated you and inspired you um i think I played, I played video games, I think, is probably where I started. Uh, a lot of things, Baldur's Gate 2, I think, was probably my first. Baldur's Gate, Baldur's Gate 2 was my first RPG. Mm -hmm. But I didn't really get into tabletops until college, because I think at some point my brain had always told me that it was, it was a nerdy thing, and I don't want to be that nerdy. I'm already yeah. playing these other games. Uh, but, like, and I started playing it in college, and I was like, but this is really fun. Like... And I've kind of changed my mentality on what the, what's levels of nerdy. I played mag I played magic at the same time. I don't play it as much now, mm -hmm. but like, it, it just seems so silly to kind of compare those at the time. They're all really fun. Just do what you like. Right? Yeah, it's it's definitely right. become a massive renaissance of um, nerdiness recently, hasn't it? I mean, um, I'm quite old now, but I I when I went to school, um, you did not let anyone know that you're interested in that sort of thing. You, um, I, I grew up with uh, Hero Quest, and literally, I had Hero Quest, but I could only play it on my own because nobody wanted to play it with me, sadly. But nowadays, like I say, I'm able to have a YouTube channel and speak to people across the world who absolutely um, have a massive passion about it. So, but it, it's great, great that you're into it. And like you say, you would you've been talking to me about your C22 system. So, would you like to? give the layman a bit of an overview about what that's that's about then please uh yeah okay so actually i'll start with how i got into developing rpgs because i i never intended to do that that was not i was like i'm gonna make video games as a side project so i started making video games and then uh i made one and didn't do great it wasn't really that fun and i was uh, i got uh but i was really enjoying rp tabletop rpgs at the time and I got a game called Gloomhaven, which a lot of people probably know. Uh, and that game is a lot of fun. I really, really like Gloomhaven. And as I was looking at the attack modifier deck, I went, wait a second. This is how I can do cards instead of dice in an RPG. So during my lunch breaks for work, I would take a deck of cards and just do some probability stuff. And I'd switch out which cards and see what all the numbers looked like. Uh, and I came up with a, a set of 22 cards mm -hmm. to replace a deck, or to replace a die, to do all checks for an RPG. Uh, and the reason I wanted a deck is well, I like drawing cards. I like playing with cards. And I... I wanted to be able to change the numbers on the die. I wanted to be able to change the probability as my character grows. Mm -hmm. So I I can now, okay, I go, 
I have a six of hearts in my deck. Yeah. Um, and now I go, I want to level up. I'm going to swap my six for a seven of spades. So now I have less hearts in my deck, more spades. Getting a little ahead of the explanation, but it just, it, I liked how that organically changed and grew, and it could kind of represent my character in a way that dice couldn't. And so that's the very mechanical side that I get really excited about. So may I ask, um, sorry to interrupt, but does that mean that you're keeping the the base value of one as well then? Because with dice games, you tend to have a dice modifier. So um, if you have a plus three and you roll a one, the minimum you could actually roll would be a four eventually. But with dice, because you're changing the probability, you're always able to keep that low, low numbers. Would that be right? Have I understood it right? Those low numbers can change, right? So if the mm -hmm. two is the lowest card in the deck, yeah. And you end up taking all your twos out right, and okay. making them threes. And your low is now a three. Yeah. So that's essentially how you change your deck. But sometimes people don't want to change their twos and they go, I'm just going to go big and they're going to try and get their first 10 in the deck. Mm -hmm. So it's ba basically, it's a little bit more elastic at the top and the bottom rather than always moving the, the window of what you can actually roll, so to speak. Yeah, yeah, it'll well, it'll always shrink it. Like mm -hmm. you're always going to advance upward, right? Yeah. It's just going to always move upward. It's a progression. Uh, but yeah, it's it's something that a dice can't really do. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But it is a little bit more complex. It takes a little bit more to learn. <laughs> That's one of the struggles I've always had with the the system. Uh, but yeah, to what? So that was the this what I first made was the the whole system just to make this work. The skills to go along with it affects all that cool stuff. Made it setting agnostic, and now I'm working on uh, freelancer's guide to a profit focused living. Mm -hmm. Is a setting for the system, and that's what I'm going to start with. It's about going on heists with a, a team of people who just don't want to work for the mega corporations that control control the galaxy. That's Let's see, that's the gist of that setting. I've got some other stuff I could read off about it if we talk a little bit more. But yeah, there's the the short. Yeah, I liked how um, when I checked out the website, you said you can pretty much use the system to almost anything that you wanted if you wanted to adapt it to like a Wild West. Um, and there's quite a few examples on, you've got some free material on your website. You've also got a couple of free... Um, items on the dms guild which i will link down below in the description for you um but you've also got some um paid um systems as well haven't you i dms guild i actually don't have anything on i don't think oh i did link drive through rpg which might be what you're sorry yes drive through rpg <laughs> they um, tend to yeah, be interchangeable I... for me because it seems to be one account yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, that makes sense. Um, so on, but yeah, on Drive Through RPG, uh, I put the free adventures on there. You could you can pay for them if you want, but they're mm -hmm. mostly there to show what the system can do. So, yeah. pay what you want. Great if someone sends me money. I have not hit the hundred dollars that Drive Through needs to send me money, but maybe one day. <laughs> Hopefully soon. Well, like I said, I'll put some links down there correctly to uh, Drive Through RPG rather than the DMs Guild as I so wrongly <laughs> messed up there. And Brendan, you um you shared with me as well uh, another game that you've been working on. Um, this was a bit of a, a strange one, as it uses a, a Plinko... Is it a Plinko board? Or yes. A Plinko machine? Yes. Uh, I do have, I have two weird games that I sort of ended up making, both out of uh, either like a bet or a random comment. Um, one of them I was talking with uh, Jim McClure at uh, Metatopia, mm -hmm. and he wanted... He always said he wanted to play an RPG that captured the feeling of you, you're in a submarine, you've just completed your mission, you're coming back, and you hear over the like intercoms, death charges dropped. And all you can do is sit and wait and hope that you don't get blown up. So I was like, we talked a little bit about it. They're like, maybe we could do this with a deck of cards, and... I was like, yeah, maybe, but I've done a lot of things with cards. I think you can do it with a Plinko board. Mm -hmm. And a Plinko board, for anyone who isn't familiar, is, uh, is on the Price is Right. They'll put this this board with a bunch of pegs in it. And you'll drop something from one of the positions, and it falls, it lands in a slot, and you get that amount of money. So uh, I made one 
where you're a spaceship and you're escaping from a heist and you tell the story of what you did on the heist or what you are doing right now and you get to put rubber bands on the Plinko board mm -hmm. to now direct where the missiles that are going to fall from the top every round are going to go. So you and your team describe connections to each other, relationships with each other, uh, things that you did in the mission, or just random world events. And then everyone has a little special power for whatever they are on the ship. Engineer or whatever, captain. And you'll put these rubber bands down. And then you'll drop all of the missiles and hope that they go in the spots that your ship isn't. And mm -hmm. then your ship moves a space and you do the whole thing all over again. But the rubber bands you put on there, at one point, stop becoming helpful because they start directing the yeah directing all of the things to where you didn't you don't want them because you need to go there. So you end up having to move the rubber bands midway, which is like changing the relationships you had with the people on your ship or explaining something has ended. It it ended up being a really narrative game. Uh, after I played through it a bit at Metatopia, so I threw that up there for free. Because honestly, the, the major cost is going to be getting a Plinko board that is the right size. Mm -hmm. I have one. Uh, I've left it in Michigan. I hope to bring it to Gen Con. At some point when I'm back in the States, mm -hmm. I will hope to bring it to Gen Con and Origins and have it in the IGDN, IGDN room, uh, Independent Games Developer Network room. So if anyone wants to try, you can just show up and play it. How, but how big is the game, one that you got? Uh, it's about four feet tall. <laughs> Four feet tall, it's made of wood, it fits in the back of my Ford. Oh, it used to fit in the back of my Ford Focus. Uh -huh. uh, I don't have that car anymore. <laughs> but, um, yeah, it, it's just, it's this massive thing, and it, it that's what costs the money. Like, that's where all the expense will go, which is why I can't sell the thing. But what are you, so the rules what are you are dropping into it? Are you... What? Um, there's these uh, air hockey pucks. Oh, right, yeah. And then it has a whole, like, white vinyl back... Uh, that you just slides on down and, uh, and then hits the all the wood. Well, made... oh, no, that wouldn't work because you need to attach the rubber bands. Well, I do put glass down in the front so nothing bounces back out, and it's sort of like you slide it down and you say, okay, we're going into the launching phase, right? So it's like a, a prep as you're like sliding it down. You get the tension to build up, and then you start dropping the missiles one by one, and you get to watch as they all go down and go, oh, I hope, I hope whatever didn't kill us, or, oh, your guys, both of your your bond here mm -hmm. is what saved you because this missile went the other way. I'm going to ask a question. I'm probably going to get the word of it wrong, but in Japan, don't they have something called pachinko machines? Is that something similar? They do. Which could they be do incorporated as well? I don't, I don't, I've never been in a pachinko parlor, bar thing. It's a, it's a betting machine mostly. So it's like going into a casino yeah. So you might be able to get your own, but I've never looked at how those operate. I don't. I don't even. I was just about to Google it, and I just realised I didn't even know how to spell it. So um, that probably wouldn't be useful. But I, can, I, I just seen the cogs turning around in your head now, thinking I can do a new game system. Am I right? <laughs> uh, well, I mean, maybe. Yeah. I'm going. Is that possible? First, I have to learn how they work. And then I go. Can I make a game with it? Yeah. So you're correct. Because it's, <laughs> the gears were turning. They are. Um, uh, ball bearings or little silver balls, aren't they? So, yeah, and I think so. In very I think big so. Quantities. So that would be. I think so. I, I have never, I've never played pachinko, so I don't know. Mm -hmm. So I think it's. I, I can't be certain. I've seen them. <laughs> you know, you'll have to find one now. <laughs> That'll be interesting. Yeah. Um, so, um, going back to the C twenty two system. Um, I like the way that you use the suits and the things like um, I, I watched the very quick overview version of the, the video that you had. I did ask oh, myself yep. why you didn't use the moose cards because the moose cards were I was quite interested in the the moose deck. Ah, uh, yes, I did <laughs> like that deck. It's starting to look faded because I've used it so much. Is it just lots of pictures of moose or? It's it's unfortunately it's the same moose on all of them. It's a good looking moose, but it's on all of them. I have that sound here. I actually have two moose decks, and yeah. both are used very heavily. They're my uh, the dealer deck. Whenever I'm the the dealer, I use both of them as the, my 
two that I use. That's that's understandable. Um, but yes, yeah. I'm, I'm glad that you did actually use the the regular deck. But um, I, lo I love the way you you build the character using the and and you can also focus depending on the suits. And then you also had the um, mitigating damage. So you you, you basically draw a, you yeah. draw and discard a card to mitigate two damage. And I think it's the red Joker yeah. is good, but the black Joker is bad. I might have that mixed up. Is that right? That is that is correct. And actually, now that you mention it, I realize that that video is slightly out of date. Um, but it's the function that all of I need to fix. I need to update that. Yeah. Thank you for the reminder. <laughs> um, but yes, uh, red Joker is like your critical success. It's a fourteen yeah. in value, and it's whatever suit you want it to be. Because suits matter. Each of the skills has like a suit that is associated with it, um, and that that changes whether you get like a plus one or a minus one on that suit. And as you level up each skill, those suits become more important. Mm -hmm. uh, then, for the soaking, which is what I'd call when you lose the like when you take too much damage and you need to, or want to prevent the damage, yeah, yeah, you'll take the top card off the deck and then it just goes lost for a while. You get it back yeah. uh, when you long rest. Uh, jokers don't leave the deck; those are super important. So, because that's what resets the deck. So, yeah, I guess I can kind of for those. That, there's a video that I explain this in. It's mostly up to date. You'll really understand the sys the system by watching it. I do need to make another one, but what I'll essentially, do is I can actually uh, put a card on this video. So I'll put it there, and in the magic of editing, we'll be able to have that link to your video. And when you update it, I will change it. So the updated one is going to be there. Uh, Hopefully. Great. I I, I was hoping just to update the one that is there, I guess. I don't know how to do that in YouTube. Okay. Well, I like your solution. Yeah. Obviously, you want to update it uh, everywhere else. You don't know want to have people just yeah. watching this interview to find a video. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's true. But essentially, yeah. Uh, in When you want to do a skill check, you'll draw one card. Mm -hmm. You use the number in the suit. To determine what your score is if it's a favorable one you'll get a plus one for being the right color and then if it's the right suit sometimes you get an additional plus one uh if it's the wrong color then you'll get a minus one uh each of the suits are related to certain aspects so like diamonds is power which will be intellect and strength spades is um like flexibility uh which will be finesse and ingenuity um hearts is resilience which will be fortitude and willpower. And then uh, clubs is going to be your social, which will be your presence and your charisma. And then each of those tie to skills, and that's how you connect the deck uh, suits to the uh, the skills and what's what's good for them. Cool. That's your, your bridge, in a way. So yeah, one card for... Sorry, yeah, you'll draw one card for when you're in, uh, in a regular check and then you'll you'll draw two and actually like at the start of your turn and craft your your turn by either with magic or with maneuvers or whatever you'll use those two to decide what you're going to do on your turn and that's how you handle encounters uh, if you draw either joker it's going to reset your deck at the end of the check you'll shuffle your your deck back in uh, face cards are also a thing mm -hmm. Um, they're not numbers, so you, if you draw a face card, you're going to keep drawing until you get whatever that is. It'll change. It'll change this to a new suit. So now this is going to be an eight of hearts, and let me make sure you can see the eight. This will yeah. be an eight of hearts, and uh, then the face card gets used. If you don't want to use it, you can store it on top of your character. You can store up to three, and that's how the basics work. A little com more complex than rolling a die, mm -hmm. but uh, I do find that once you play one game of this, it, it all connect clicks. Everything sort of makes sense, but there is that learning curve. Yeah, yeah, and it's like I say, it's quite easily accessible as well because pretty much almost anyone would probably have a a pack of cards um, kicking around the house. Yeah, so. yeah and uh, I really hope that they could be super uh, like. What's a what's the term for it? Uh, you can you can get real creative with your deck of cards. You can very unique. People have some that they really like of just different artwork that they like on it. I think you can get really uh, more than more than what a die can do. You can do you can get even more on this. Like moose cards on the, on the deck. 
I like moose cards. Yeah. If you like Sweden, or have somebody you know who's from Sweden and sends you moose cards. <laughs> That's awesome. Um, so um, we've talked about the game. We've talked about you, and um, so have we talked about Japan yet? So you've moved over here in a few few yeah. months. You've just got your computer, I remember, because you we we've been speaking yep. for yep. a couple of months now. Um, how is how is Japan treating you now? Um. It's been it's been a pretty crazy few months of just moving, especially during COVID. I do not recommend people to travel during this COVID stuff. Luckily, we're mostly over with a lot of vaccines mm -hmm. coming through. Uh, but yeah, that was that was hectic. Uh, getting everything shipped and sent on a boat. All my stuff was gone for three months. Uh, took a lot longer because ports were all backed up. A lot of yeah. people are probably experiencing that for their Kickstarters. And uh, yeah, I find I got here. My Japanese was was decent, but there's just a lot of like little interactions at the store of like, uh, do you want a bag? And I go, uh, hold on, what would you say? I had to just get used to the way that they say that. Um, uh, garbage is there's there's five different types of garbage. I, I don't put everything in one can or two cans. Uh, no, there's there's five, and they have different days that they need to go out. Mm -hmm. I had to get used to that. Um, so it's a lot of those things. That's getting used to other things like living in a big city. Uh, it's it's always busy mm -hmm. for me. I came from suburbs of uh, Detroit, Michigan, so it was it was quiet around where I was. Um, my apartment didn't have too much happening around it, uh, which was nice. I could be alone and and uh, yeah, not hear too much of the noise. But I, I hear the noise quite a bit when I'm out. Whenever I step outside, there's people. Yeah. Um, it's nice. I could go to a convenience store, like wherever. I could take a train and go. Like I don't need a car in Tokyo. Mm -hmm. Cars are expensive. That's really nice. Um, I did. I did get my first driving experience last weekend. Second, I guess. But driving on the wrong side of the road for me, uh, for you, would probably be fine. Uh, it'd be fine for me. <laughs> uh, but that was new. Uh, very scary the first time I did it. I'm like, okay, wait. I'm drifting. I keep drifting to the wrong side. Uh, I, I, I'm lining up. I'm not in the right things. I go, okay, when I turn, I'm turning to that side. Like I, It's always remembering that. But then the second time I did it, and I drove all last weekend, I was feeling a lot more comfortable. Um, but yeah, it's just, it feels like I've been adjusting mm -hmm. and been busy for the last five months. And I'm really hoping to just kind of get comfortable. I'm finally hoping to be like, okay, I'm settled in. Um, are, you, are you planning on staying for good or just for long term or uh, my wife and I were planning on staying for uh, about three years might be four depending on how the lease works out but that's about what we're, we're thinking and then we'll try this. being in America for a little bit and then we'll decide which spot we want to be in yeah that's amazing that's amazing very, very brave and bold thing to do so um, very very inspiring yeah. Uh, oh, anything? Anything you specifically want to know about Japan? Because like, it's probably, it's probably like ordinary to me because I've been to Japan a few times at this point. Mm -hmm. But like, it might be super interesting to you or your like viewers. Like, what what's something that you want to know? And um, maybe I can be like, oh yeah, this happens or this is um, the way that's I've, done. I've traveled over Asia. My wife is um, from a country not far from you where you are now called Myanmar um, okay so I've got a bit of an idea of what it's like over there but not Japan because I've been to China um, but Brave. they're very I assume they're very very different worlds so the weird thing about China was I felt I felt safe everywhere um, and also literally the amount of people was just far bigger than anything I experienced and like I say I'm from London is it as glitzy as it t appears on the TV? You know, Shibuya, um, the big gaming areas. Um, wh wh what is that like? Yeah, so my first time to Tokyo was actually four years ago when I actually met my wife in person. We had done language exchange before that, mm -hmm. but um, my friends and I went to Shinjuku, Shibuya, uh, and this was before COVID, so people were all out. And it was, there were people everywhere. It was ridiculous. I, 
definitely sensory overload is something that can it, it can happen to you if you're not used to it. And um, I I definitely felt a little overwhelmed the first time, but but Shinjuku like things are just happening. It's like two in the morning, and you're like, huh? Yep, no, this is things are still still happening. It doesn't look like the city's gonna really ever shut down, yeah. which is the first time I've ever experienced that because I hadn't really been to a major city. Uh, the gaming spot specifically let's see Akihabara is where we went to a few times and um, yeah, that was nice you could you could experience some of the kind of nerd culture there but one of our more memorable experiences when we went to we went to a maid cafe as my friends did and uh, we we liked it because it was so quiet it was just this like we sat down and like this lady did talk she was wearing this full maid outfit poured tea very professionally left no talking and we just got to sit there and like close our eyes and just enjoy the silence mm-hmm. and the lack of busyness which was really a nice escape from the the city uh that was sort of my experience with it it was still really cool I don't, don't get me wrong the sensory thing is like yeah the, the glitziness is still there like that's for sure something that you'd experience uh, but yeah, I, I did enjoy it. Still, it was it was nice. It was just some relaxing moments were a little more <laughs> rare. Excellent. And finally, um, I would like to ask what sort of advice or um, suggestions you can give to anyone wanting to try RPGs, or even if they're wanting to develop and build their own. People wanting to try RPGs. Uh, yeah, just. Just do it if you can. I, I, I really enjoyed it when I started it. Um, and there are a lot of systems out there. There really are. Um, it would be, be obviously it'd be best to find the one that fits you, but that's a, a huge time investment. Uh, find start with some of the popular one, ones or whatever. Check which one sort of fits, or talk to people who who recommend their own. If you're not gonna, if you don't have one that like you have in mind, let's say you've got a friend who really likes one, just play the one they want to they want to play then and get in and see how that works and if that style fits you. I think that's probably the easiest way uh, to get into them. As for those that want to do RPG development, um, I'm actually in a couple servers of people making their own RPGs. And um, I, let's say July this year, I started helping review other, over other people's RPGs uh, in development. So... Uh, what I can tell the most is, I think the first step when you want to make an RPG is well, read a lot of RPGs. That would be the, the first step. But if you if you are like, okay, I want to make an RPG, um, yeah, read RPGs. But if you have a specific experience that you want to do, that's the best place to start. You should you should know what your ideal session looks like. Come up with that. Figure out, sit there and go and imagine your, you and your friends at a table playing something and what what that experience should feel like, what that experience um, should look like, what you should be doing in that. That's, that's what you want to base your mechanics off of. You'll start with trying to capture what that feeling is by the, you know, applying the correct dice or using cards or whatever strange mechanic. I know I'm a little opposite in what I do. I usually take a mechanic and go, how can I make something cool out of this? <laughs> um, but I actually do recommend starting with the core experience yeah. uh, because that's actually how I come up with my strongest settings and stories and campaigns is always with a good core experience. Excellent. Excellent. Well, thank you ever so much for that, Brandon. Um, it's been an absolute pleasure to speak to you. Um, it's been a wonderful learning experience finding out about new systems, the C22 system, which, like I say, I'll put links to your website and everything in the Thank description you. below. Um, so people can definitely check it out. Um, but yes, uh, thank you. I wish you every luck with your endeavours. You have something coming up um, soon. I understand you'll be, you've you been working a lot on rules, yes. isn't it? So is that... When yeah. Is that out? I'm trying. I'm trying to get my quick start out for Freelancer's Guide to a Profit Focused Living, mm-hmm. or Freelancer's Guide for short. I'm hoping that'll be done around the end of November, because I want to do the Kickstarter uh, in February, February twenty second, twenty twenty two. 
it's the date that I'm targeting. <laughs> yeah, we're gonna go hard in the twos. That's 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 what we're aiming for for this. Uh, yeah, that's I'm hoping for for the Kickstarter to get this printed to get uh, the first setting out. There'll hopefully be a lot of different ships that you can play, you can buy a lot of different equipment because that's what this heist one is about. It's about stealing money, getting equipment, setting up yourself as like this. Uh, I don't know group uh, outside of the corporations and uh yeah making money uh from there i'll probably have other systems that i'm working on i really do want to make a steampunk world Mm -hmm. Um, that's that's something i'm very excited about but this has to get done first yeah well what we'll do we'll make sure we keep in touch and hopefully when the kickstarter goes live we can chat again and hopefully do something together collaborate so thank you once again and take care thank you